Namaste and in La Ketch. And hi, I'm Zen Benefield. This is One World in a New World. And as always, Namaste and in La Ketch may sound a little weird. However, they are ancient languages. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit spoken, it's Brahmi, and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In La Ketch comes from the other side of the world, the Mayan culture, and it means I am another you. So imagine if you could go into your world, your environment, the people, places, and things that you frequent with that kind of knowledge. And it's an ancient knowledge that we have forgotten about. So check it out, try it out, test it. Don't believe me, try it for yourself, all right? So this week's guest is an old friend, Steve Bassett. And Steve is executive director at Paradigm Research Group. Now, what's that about? Well, PRG is a political advocacy organization that addresses the politics of the UFO and ET issue. It has a political, uh, easy for me to say, political action committee called XPPAC and holds an annual conference called the X Conference in Washington, D.C. area. Now, Steve organized a national press conference years ago and also a mock congressional hearing regarding the topic of disclosure about UFOs and government secrecy. Steve, glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Cool. So let's just jump right in. You know, in the early parts of your life, I'm sure that there was at least some fascination with things out there. And yet, was there something in there, inside you, that kind of prompted that? Was there any kind of, of inquiry or event or, or, you know, even maybe even a, some kind of an awakening that mm, no. things? Not, a, not an awakening. I, uh, uh, I was kind of a withdrawn kid and not particularly happy. Okay. So uh, I, uh, I, I got into books. Not a lot. I'm not really a book reader, but... I found science fiction in oh, my fascinating life. worlds, aren't they? That's right. And this was the fifties, and uh, that was a uh, at the time considered like the golden age of science fiction. Some of the greats were writing then. Heinlein being one of a right. number, Arthur C. Clarke and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So, Stranger is one of my favorites. And television wasn't all that good back then. There was no internet, no streaming services or anything like that. So uh, a, a good sci-fi book to me was like wow that's entertaining so sure. i'm reading a lot of sci-fi and uh and, and and at the same time i'm noticing these occasional articles in the press about ufos something connected to it and and so not surprisingly uh i thought that was cool so i'm paying attention got peaked. that's right and very quickly uh, based upon what I was reading, I concluded, well, there's only one explanation for this, and that's extraterrestrials, like the ones I'm reading in the sci-fi books. All right? mm -hmm. There's actually some real ones here. It was pretty straightforward to me. It seemed like common sense. Uh, and then as time went by, each thing I read just reinforced that. So part of me was going, well, gee, where, where's all the attention to this? Where's, where's, uh, this is a big thing. Where's the government? Where's the big press? So forth. Uh, and it wasn't happening. But I didn't fixate on that too much because uh, I was young and had a life to try to build or whatever. And so I just kind of put it aside. But it, in, at the age of like 15 or 16, I was fully convinced there was an ET presence just based upon what was being published in mainstream press. Mm -hmm. and that was a long time ago. I had a good feeling have, of it. Yeah. I could never have imagined that. Yeah. 50 years later, 60 years later, uh, we're still debating whether, is it real? Uh, is it extraterrestrial? But that's the way it worked out. Yeah. What can I say? Isn't it kind of strange? You know, uh, I remember a dinner you and I had long ago. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago, it seems, but you made a comment to me about, you know, I don't get you guys, meaning the, the experiencers, right? Because you had never had an experience. And yet, there was this compulsion almost that you had to focus in and learn more, share more, draw attention to, and say, hey guys, you know, what the heck's going on here? So what was that like initially? When did you, when did you first start beginning 
or first start to mm. go into that arena? What I'm doing now is a is a basically a hybrid or a combination of one very carefully early, in that word. Yeah, <laughs> early early uh, uh, interest and 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 you know loving sci-fi, kind of <clears throat> interested in science. And then seeing the interviews and, and seeing the articles about the ET issue, UFO issue, and realizing this is clearly extraterrestrial. So I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to finding that out. But then after I went to college, my life changed quite, quite a bit because I entered school, a college in 1964, as the Vietnam War was turning serious. It was about to become Rough time. a really big deal. And so in these very formative years, when you're supposedly becoming an adult now, you've left home and you're in school and you're 17. And, and uh, from that point forward, the Vietnam War for years and years and years was dominating um, my, I guess you could say, coming of age. Uh, uh, As it did with many at that time. That's right. Some people turned away from it and just said, look, I'm just going to study this, Greek philosophy, whatever else. I don't care what's going on. I, I, did, I wasn't. Of course, I was also a Navy brat. My father was in the military, so I'd mm. grown up on, around military bases. And so naturally, a, a military engagement like Vietnam was going to be something I would likely to pay attention to. Sure. And it, it was awful. It, 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 completely, it completely changed my entire worldview, uh, my, my thinking about my country, what it stood for, what it was capable of, uh, and the awfulness of it just completely polluted those formative years. I, I, if I had been a more disciplined person, perhaps been given a little bit more tools by my parents growing up, I might have been able to cope with that. I didn't cope with it well. And so the next eight years, from basically 64 to 72, uh, I became extremely dissatisfied, uncomfortable, um, and came to have a, a sense about, about war and what it meant uh, without actually going there. Thank God I didn't go. I didn't have to go. But boy, uh, a lot of people did, and I saw what happened to them. So I essentially became an act anti-war activist, whether I was, was uh, active or not. And I did some things. I marched in some, some events and, and what have you, but I did not join up and really get pro, go pro, right? I mm -hmm. uh, wish I had, but I, I didn't. I was too afraid. I was too immature. And so consequently, um, that act that shaped my worldview in a way that uh, ultimately meant that one day I was going to become an activist. And so when I got into this issue, I got into it not as somebody seeking proof for the ET issue. I already knew ETs were here. Right not because I was fascinated with it or because I thought it was cool that they were from outer space or kind of a sci-fi connection. No, I got into it as an activist uh, to, to try to engage the issue as an activist. And that is where the passion comes from. So I am basically an anti-war yeah, anti activist disguised as a disclosure activist. <laughs> that's, that's how I could phrase it. Well, that's kind of, from my experience and understanding and the folks that I know, uh, that's kind of what they're trying to communicate. You know, you guys got to learn to get along and work together better. And, you know, then other things can happen as a result. But until that time, we're this barbaric world that, you know, nobody out there really wants to visit much. Well, that's an interesting point because uh, after I got into the issue, back in 96 and started to pay more attention and learn more, I began to see uh, a significant connection between their presence and our dilemma. Um, so I can make a case that there is a significant political aspect, I could call it political, exopolitical aspect to this, to this phenomena. It's many things, it's not one sure. thing, but it, th there's a, more than enough evidence to show that the, the ex extraterrestrial presence and a lot of their activity <clears throat> is connected to circumstances that the human race is facing circa 1947. Right. 
uh, and the connection to the, the atomic bombs in Japan, the development of atomic weapons, missiles, all of that, uh, is, it's not a coincidence that their, their presence became far more uh, prolific. Uh, they were being seen more, more active, uh, and the phenomena just started growing very rapidly after 47. That is not an accident. And then this connection becomes just completely manifest when the evidence finally emerges that one of the things they've been doing when they're flying around uh, is uh, hovering over our, our, our nuclear facilities and turning the weapons off. Right. We have this, a mutual friend, Robert Salas, that was inside one of those facilities when it happened. Sure. He's one of the key witnesses. Yeah. This, this, this is probably one of the most extraordinary pieces of information the human race has ever been privy to. And I mean ever, going all the way back. Mm -hmm. the, the information that non-human entities from elsewhere are in our presence and have actually taken the action of turning our nuclear weapons off, not once, but a number of times, and not just the US, but also in the Soviet Union. The implications of that simple act uh, is, is you could spend your life studying that. It, it should be debated and discussed in every university in the country. It should be on all the forums. It's one of the most important pieces of information ever. But in fact, it is not because the government really worked hard to prevent that fact from being discussed, debated, covered. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, uh, uh, whatever the intentions of the ETs with respect to that, we still don't fully know, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that a civilization that has built enough weapons, nuclear weapons, to destroy pretty much all of its fundamental infrastructure and send itself back a very long period of time, kill billions of people, a civilization that done that, and then ET show up and start turning those very weapons off, that is not a coincidence, that is not trivial, that is a big deal. And the question is, what is it? It's what, a simple what is the... and profound message, it would seem. It would seem. Um, some people interpret it as a threat, meaning uh, we can turn your weapons off. So, Well, if you're looking for enemies, you're always going to find them no matter what. Exactly. So some people take that point of view. It, it, it's not illogical. Uh, that is not the point of view that the witnesses, by and large, have taken. Um, they view it pretty much as they view it as I do. It, is right. that this wasn't a threat. This was a message. Well, even Wilbert Smith, and then uh, I'm sure you're familiar with his material. The it's called the New Science or Memoirs. He ran the Canada's UFO right. investigation program in the mid or during the 50s. Well-respected scientist, and you know, in these memoirs, of course, I don't think he ever intended them to be published, but. After, two years after his death, they were somehow. And I found those fascinating. Uh, they appeared, you know, on, on my screen, oh, maybe a year or so ago uh, through Grant, Grant Cameron. And I read books. I'm like, I'm fascinated because it all makes sense. You know, the, all of the concepts that they presented that are outside of our purview and understanding at this point made perfect sense to me. And I would encourage others to read stuff like that because there's science in it and, and they present it as a, a science beyond what we understand to date, such as that, you know, our attention and awareness produce reality. Well, that's something we don't necessarily think about, but yet here's the law of attraction on one side that says, yeah, this is what's going on. You know, they miss the interaction part of that. And then the, something else they told him was that their concept of time is a measurement of the change of entropy. Even though we, you know, have the day and night, the 24 hour clock, and we're based on that, the experience of time is quite different. Again, these are fascinating uh, poss possibilities, fascinating, interpreta fascinating interpretations, which I look forward to seeing explored in depth in the post-disclosure world. Mm -hmm. but until we get disclosure, confirmation from the heads of state, these things are not going to be 
uh, publicly engaged. They're not going to be properly investigated. We're not going to have an understanding of it. We're being denied that by the government, which I believe, by the way, knew about this nuclear connection long ago. That oh, sure, uh, they're not. They're certainly not dumb, and most of those guys are pretty sharp. And now, and here it is: the the quandary. You know, human beings as they are with the unknown, all of a sudden, you know, things start showing up or other beings from other worlds, the first thing they're gonna do is be afraid of them because that's what all the movies were about, right? This is the programming that's taken place on purpose or not, who's to say, right? But it's what happened. And we're kind of in the same place still. There's a lot of movies that have come out recently, you know, and the remake of Travis movie too, that certainly helped because the first one was like, Oh my God, it, it, you know, he was just horrified by how it came out. Um, so how do you see this evolving or how have you seen it evolve over the last, let's say 20 years, as far as the number of people? I realize, you know, you're pushing for the government disclosure, but there's been a groundswell, it seems, and I know you're kind of in the thick of it. What have you seen with that? Certainly. Uh, the last five years are the most um, prolific on this issue ever. And uh, we've, we've crossed a number of milestones. So we are in the, barring something dramatic intervening, we are in the, the final phase of what I call this transition mm -hmm. from a, a civilization that has no idea that there's extraterrestrials to a civilization that is fully aware that they, they exist and are here and visiting us now. Uh, and this, this shouldn't have taken this long, but histor history is, uh, is tough and, and it's always throwing curveballs at you and creating issues. So we're now 75 years into uh, the, the uh, modern era, which began again in 1947 with Roswell. Right, um, in, in the midst of the industrial age where it it's, was always command and control structures yeah i mean the et's uh, manifest themselves in great numbers right after world war ii the second world war as we're building these weapons so clearly they would know that the future was probably very problematic for human beings in other words once you once you cross the nuclear weapons threshold and and the physics is the same throughout the galaxy i mean there are other planets i'm sure throughout this galaxy over time maybe 10 billion years ago, it could be a billion years ago, uh, who reached the same point that we have. If you have, if you have sentience and you have the ability to manipulate right, things, right. you're eventually going to figure out nuclear physics and you're going to build nuclear weapons. So mm -hmm. this is not unique. No. Uh, it, now, one of the things that, that really um, I found rather profound, and I was told about it, um, I met Edgar Mitchell in 1997 at the Prophets Conference here in Phoenix. I was running the conference mm -hmm. and we had several conversations over the weekend and I shared some of my experiences and he shared some of his and, and evidently we developed, a, a he got, uh, gained a sense of trust with me. And after four or five conversations, and they were short, but he says to me, he says, you know, I want to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody until after I'm dead. And that kind of set me back for a moment. It was like, wow, this is gonna be pretty important. And he said, you know, on the way down to the moon in the LEM, there was this metallic silver cylinder. He says, it may have been one, just one, could have been several, I couldn't really tell because the window was so small, I couldn't really see a whole lot, right? However, this metallic silver cylinder was spiraling, spiraling around the LEM, the lunar excursion module, all the way down to the surface. And he knew that it wasn't anything from Earth. Wasn't sure whether it was piloted or it was from the surface. And he wasn't quite sure of the size. He thought maybe it was a meter in diameter and three meters long from his vantage point. He, again, he wasn't really sure. But what it revealed was that these guys have been there for a while. Now it also, and you may have even heard it too, back years ago um, when Buzz and, and Neil had been there, there was a, 
some talk through the grapevine of them seeing these same cylinders or ones like it standing upright on a rectangular platform just beyond the dark side of the moon. Was that something that crossed your information no. at, at some point? No, 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 that, that's, well, that, that kind of stories, there were lots of these things that got floated around. It was easy right. to start them up. That's right. one thing. Well, Edgar, you know, having but, his experience, you know, direct experience and him telling me that uh, to me what was profound. And also, I don't think we went back there after that. And it wouldn't surprise me if they finally, you know, just said, hey, look, guys, you can't get along down there. Don't come here yet. I don't know. But it that, would make sense. Yeah. Uh, look, all I can say is, is that the, the very stories that have been floated around are one thing. But Edgar Mitchell telling you personally, and I've never heard this before, and that's pretty significant then, if he told you that and, so, and, and told you not to say anything to Lothner is dead, this is new uh, and you're obviously going public with this. Um, maybe he has told somebody else that who may choose to go public, but that has my attention. A lot of the other stories we've heard about this, that, what have you, they 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 just don't have enough gravitas or enough uh, substance for me but sure. uh, a first hand statement like that or a second hand statement that is my attention so i'll be uh, uh, have myself attuned to maybe pick up something about kind of listen it. see what what's going on somewhere yeah um and i was surprised you know it, it's um it was something i felt very humbled in him even being able to tell me that and the you know some kind of sense you know ha having been where he was and his discussions uh, and you know not necessarily revelations but revealing what happened to him and his increase in awareness uh, of the greater consciousness and of course then coming back and starting the Noet noetic sciences institute um, those kinds of things and looking for how consciousness developed now so here's the two sides of that story right you've got the nuts and bolts the craft and the shutting off of the um, missile silos and things and then you've got the other side which seems to be more um, I don't want to say esoteric but within a, a non-physical application or communication and experiences in other planes of consciousness or dream states or um, you know, those kinds of things, hypnagogic, hypnagogic states and, and even the liminal space, which, you know, we haven't really explored all that much. A lot of the ancient teachings and had ways of, of doing so, but then those have been lost over the years. And now, what, maybe in the last 10, 15 years, uh, and a lot of that's kind of been explored by Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove on originally Thinking Aloud, now New Thinking Aloud, where he's exploring the different realms of consciousness and what's available in them, which seems to be congruent with the communications that are happening and the stories from the different kinds of experiencers, as you've probably heard from time. Well, contactees repeatedly, consistently talk about the fact that ETs are telepathic. They, mm -hmm. they communicate telepathically, which, <clears throat> which means that telepathy is normal. Everything is normal in this universe, by the way. There's no such thing as paranormal. And so that's no. I agree with you. It's uh, just discovering what that normal really is and, sure. and the acquiescing to it rather than trying to project what we believe it to be. And one of the most significant things that we would love to know about, of course, our government doesn't acknowledge there's any ETs or telepathy or any of that, but sure. uh, uh, the public are moving past that. One of the most significant things about telepathy that we would like to be able to determine is, is, if it's, is it non-local? Um, Edgar actually did this. He did a, an experiment, and he talked about it publicly many times on that trip to the moon. He was working with a psychic back in, on Earth. Uh, I've heard it was Ingo Swan. It could have been some other. The point is that they were trying to do communications mm -hmm. um, and also measure the time in other words they were they were communicating and they were noting the times and they were trying to maybe even determine whether the communication was instantaneous meaning non-local right 
um, which, if true, would be extremely profound. Telepathy is not, to me, that profound. Non-local telepathy, instant communication over distance, that would be profound. So he was doing that. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps, as he stated, he, he saw something um, significant uh, uh, during his mission. And I know that, and I, and I, and I know this for a fact, that, that uh, Edgar, all the astronauts are pretty much this way, but Edgar's attitude about his experience was he was never going to do anything that would discredit NASA. In other words, he, he, he said Roswell was an extraterrestrial uh, crash because he he had a number of people actually tell him that firsthand witnesses and he grew up there yeah and he grew up there too which is one of the reasons that a lot of these witnesses talked to him so he said that um, he he talked about the experiment that he did um, which was not too much of a, I think a a problem for NASA plus there were people on Earth that the people he was involved with that had gotten it out. And he founded the new Institute of Noetic Sciences, so it fit into that. So he talked about that. But overall, he was not going to do anything to discredit NASA. Why? Because he owed NASA everything. In mm -hmm. other words, he goes, who, who sends him to the moon? Who gives him the chance to walk on the moon? It's NASA. And, and that's true of all the astronauts. And so if he, in fact, saw a cylinder of some kind, literally maneuvering around the um, the the, the lander as it was going down uh we don't we don't have that kind of technology he would have he that would have confirmed the et presence if in general if not on the moon and for him to talk about that would have created pro problems for nasa because nasa's position of course was not to go sure. there not to investigate this issue and to downplay it and so i could see him doing that and i think there are some other astronauts that may know some things that they are not going public on Mm -hmm. uh, because they they have a powerful allegiance to NASA and what it did and what it did for them. I have no problem with that. But it would certainly account for the fact sure. that when he got back, eventually he became a significant person uh, in the uh, disclosure process. Mm -hmm. he, he, he lended a lot of gravitas to it. He, he took some heat for it. NASA did some things that were not, not nice. And I think part of the reason is that was he's causing some problems and what he did say, but he right. did have a limitation there. Uh, and I wish he was still alive. Um, I think I too. he was one of the most genuine, sincere, you know, truthful, honest people I have ever met. And I, I, it, I'm sure you've met him and can say the same thing. He was just authentic. He was a brilliant, authentic, righteous guy. Um, yeah. Had his problems in life, like everybody else. We all do, yeah. Um, and uh, that made it more difficult than it needed to be. A lot of the astronauts had problems coming back. Some of which may be because, again, they may have figured out or learned. It's or, or, or experienced yeah. something, and they come back and they can't talk about it. It's like, oh my God, I got to hold this inside. It, you know, and I can see on one side if there was a disclosure. I don't know that humanity as a whole is intellectually humble and psycholo psychologically safe enough to not become so fearful and, you know, um, out of control. Well, I can answer that question. Humanity and the collective is quite, quite okay. It's going to be quite fine with it. Uh, we, we, the issue has been Maybe now, back then, I don't know. Well, oh, back then. Uh, well, no. Nah, well, and the, and the, I think because of, and I have to, uh, I don't want to say assume, but when you have, and when you have people in charge of populations, they want to keep them safe at any cost. And so mm -hmm. anything that could inhibit that would be downplayed. Well, that may be the case, but it's not acceptable to me. Uh, that's and not the way. But from that standpoint, you know, they're concerned, right or wrong, because of the way, because these guys think more analytically and structurally and in the command and control space as opposed to a more open, vulnerable, authentic, hey, let's explore this, see what happens and share, uh, share with others what we find. Right? They had their reasons for embargoing the truth that they learned without doubt 
at Roswell, 47, and mm -hmm. confirmed for them. They had their reasons. But I don't want to disappoint anybody. I, I don't think that their concern for how uncomfortable humans would be if we learned that was one of those reasons. They could care less. If they really cared about, and by the way, the United States is not the only nation that's embargoed this. China, oh, Russia, sure. the UK, France. If they were really concerned about our welfare, they wouldn't have built 85,000 nuclear weapons. All right. So no, it's not, it's not the reason. Uh, they yeah, had that's kind of reason. oxymoronic, isn't it? Yeah, they, 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 had, their, they had their reasons. Uh, and to get back to your earlier question, uh, in terms of the, just a simple outline of, of the disclosure process, the government had its first best opportunity to, an, to, to, to reveal the ET presence in 47. All they had to do was just let the reporters arrive in Roswell and give them interviews. And the Air Force, the Air, Army Air Force would have been a major hero around the world, been the great, biggest story in the world. It would attract enormous attention. Um, the U.S. would have been... Uh, uh, it would have been a, a wonderful post-World War II issue to engage after slaughtering all these hundreds of millions of people uh, and, and, and destroying uh, cities and polluting the ocean and everything else. Wow, we can now, let's talk about what it means to have extraterrestrials engaging us. Um, but that's not the path they took. That was their first chance. The Cold War virtually locked it up. So for the next 44 years, uh, it was locked down. They had their chance in 47. The next chance was 91, 92. When the Cold War ends, the Soviet Union disbands, uh, and we seem to have the prospect for some, a relatively an age of, as you say, detente, uh, mm -hmm. uh, less dangerous time. And there was an effort to do it. And that effort came during the Clinton administration, 93. Rockefeller was the, the, the funder of this. He was the, the organizer. A lot of people were involved, and Clinton was persuaded to try to take action. However, the uh, situation at the time was such that the Department of Defense and the military intelligence complex in general basically said, go to hell. Uh, in other words, uh, we don't like you, we don't, we, don't, we don't admire you, we don't like you, and so whatever you want, even though you have the right to have it, you're not going to get it. And they stonewalled him, lied to him which uh, then created a whole series of things that followed from that. But that was the next chance. Clinton could have been the disclosure president and the military intelligence community, which had been reigning supreme during the Cold War. God knows. I mean, we looked up to them as like, please save us from the, the, the Soviets. And I get that. Uh, so they, they stopped it. The next uh, period goes from 93 to 2017. We, we, we really... A lot of things happened and things got better. The disclosure move process moved forward. Disclosure activism developed. But we never really came close to disclosure um, between uh, uh, 1993 and 2017. And then we enter this third phase. The third opportunity to get disclosure arrives in uh, uh, that period of around 2016. Uh, and that, that this is a story that ha, ha, is, is going to take some effort to fully uh, disclose, to fully uh, understand it. It's going to take a lot of work. Uh, an opportunity for that is not there yet, but I hope to be involved in that. But essentially, Hillary Clinton, her, her, uh, uh, who, the wife of, of Bill Clinton, who was completely stonewalled by his own government, I believe made the decision at some point between 2000 uh, and uh, 2014 when she ran the second time that if she became president, she was going to get those files. She was going to end this cover up, this not cover up, I call it a truth embargo, that's what it is. She was going to do it. She was going to be the disclosure president and go down in history and vindicate her husband and so forth. That was, that was established, I think. And a lot of people knew it. It became increasingly clear that something was going on. Uh, a lot of that came from actions on the part of her, one of her closest confidants, her campaign co-chair, John Podesta, former advisor to her husband. He, he kept the issue alive all those years from 2000 to, to 2016. He became her campaign uh, chairman. I sort of knew all this. I sort of saw this unfolding, which is why I came, to, I, I went, I came back to Washington and, and, and made a very uh, concerted effort to try to build a story about that in her campaign. In other words, you're running for president. You have a clear connection to this issue, as does your campaign chairman, as does 
your husband, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, the press should be covering that because you want to be the president of the United States. And I was successful. We got some initial articles. We got some reporters on board. They started contacting the campaign. The campaign basically said, said nothing. They wouldn't even respond, which convinced them there was a story there. And before the election was over, 400 articles had been written in mainstream media in the U.S., English language, U.S. and the U.K. and elsewhere about her connection to this issue. 400 articles. Unprecedented. Nothing like that had ever happened in a presidential campaign before. And so that ultimately, while it, it made her uncomfortable, it forced her and her husband and John Podesta to make statements uh, on various talk shows and so forth to show that they weren't completely stonewalling the press. I'm sure they weren't thrilled. They wanted to just get to the White House and then do it, not have to talk about it on the way in. Right. Nevertheless, all that media would uh, uh, have been extremely useful to her once she comes in to the White House to make a move on this, because clearly the media would have been totally receptive. Now, what we didn't know, uh, as, as I was doing that work in 2015, 2016, and these articles were being generated, what I didn't know was that people within the military intelligence complex itself had come to the same conclusion that I had, meaning that's what's going to happen. She's headed in that direction. She's going to disclose. And for me, it was like, wow, let's get disclosure. Well, cool. For oh, them, though, it's like, oh, no. But for them, it was a very different problem. It, sure. it, it was a very different issue. The, 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 there were people inside the military intelligence complex, meaning the DOD, Air Force, uh, CIA, and perhaps other agencies. They knew full well that if, a, if, if Hillary Clinton became president, and move to get those files, ultimately forcing disclosure, their situation was going to be not good at all. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, the military intelligence complex was essentially the maintainer of the truth embargo all this time, with the approval of those presidents that were so informed, not all of them were. And so the politicians were going to simply throw the, the Department of Defense and the Air Force and the Navy and the CIA under the bus. They were going to blame the whole truth embargo on them, meaning, oh, we wanted to tell you, but they wouldn't let us, and they stonewall us, and they lied, and they did this, and and uh, that 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 was not a prospect that they were looking forward to. Sure, uh, they viewed themselves as the protectors of the nation, which they essentially did, uh, and and righteous people, and 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 concerned about national security and the country and their families, and 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 ninety nine percent of them probably are exactly that way. But so being thrown under the bus was not something that they looked forward to. And so enough of them made the decision some, that, formed, that came together mid-2015 through the end of that year and then into 2016 that they were going to take, how would you say, action on their own. And what would that be? Uh, it, it, it came down to this. And there were quite a few, there, there were scores of people, I think, that were mm -hmm. communicating within the military intelligence concept, pri pro complex privately, discussions going on a little here in the land, and it sort of then gelled into a plan. But the plan was this, as, as, as employees of the government or a member of the service or CIA or anything else, we cannot do anything, right? Anything we do would be illegal, destroy our career, cause problems, and probably be wrong. So the only way we're going to be able to influence this situation with this deal with this problem that's heading for us like a freight train, the election of Hillary Clinton, uh, is we're going to have to create a private organization compromised of former employees of the government, now retired or no longer employed, who then are free to do a lot of things that they couldn't do while working for the government. Mm -hmm. And this plan eventually came to be known as the To the Stars Academy of Science. It was launched on October 11th of 2017. But it was not supposed to be launched then. It was supposed to get launched after she won the election in late 2016, early 2017, under a Clinton presidency. And that didn't happen, which completely threw the whole plan up in the air, creating a real problem for them because we're, we're, we're sort of outed. In other words, this plan had been outed uh, by Tom DeLong in March of 2016 without naming names and without naming the, you know, giving the name of it and 
getting into too much detail, but he, they added in a three hour interview with George Knapp. And then the plan was somewhat outed again when the WikiLeaks emails were dumped out of uh, Podesta's server, mm -hmm. in which it showed that DeLong and others were communicating with, uh, with Podesta about UAP. Uh, obviously something was in the work. What the hell is going on there? He was the campaign chairman for Clinton and he's communicating with people that are connected to this issue that are formerly with the, with the Department of Defense including a guy who says he's, he's, he's got a big project in the works. By the way, the Republicans were not approached. The Republican National Committee was not approached and neither was uh, the chairman of uh, any of those uh, Republican campaigns. It was just the, mm -hmm. the Democrats. And so those, those 50,000 emails contained a hundred or so emails related to this issue, all of which are archived on my website. You can go see them all. And that outed it. And then she loses. And so now what do you do? I mean, it was a real problem. They made the decision that after surveying the, the landscape and considering options, that they would go ahead, even though it was going to be riskier, and launch on October 11th of 2017. And that was the beginning of this uh, now four and a half year period, mm -hmm. which will historically be viewed as the last days, months, years of the truth embargo. An so enormous what? amount has happened since then. And ultimately, I think they this is going to work, but it's still clear as to how soon because of the extraordinary things that have taken place in the last four and a half years, stuff I couldn't even imagine happening. Right, right, right. Um, and, and I've seen a lot of this stuff too, the, the videos and the, um, the testimonies from pilots and people on ships and things of, of that nature. Mm -hmm. but, Let's uh, let's go back to what you were saying uh, earlier in the, you know, the the challenges between the U.S. and Russia, and you've you've been a lot of places all over the world, and and I want to kind of bring it back to how do the people, you know, we we have this, um, I think, false notion that it's the people of these nations that are against other nations and things like that. It's really not. It's a select few that are in charge and. and they've always been that way. It's kind of like um, Howard Bloom's book on, it's called The Lucifer Principle. He does a scientific exploration of history and how a few people manipulate masses and sometimes entire populations yeah. by controlling the media and the narrative and telling lies until they're believed to be true. Because we hear them so much, it's like, oh, we heard it all the time. That, you know, it must be true, right? Yeah. I don't believe that. And I don't, think many do once they believe what you know, believe what that that we're being you know when something when we're being told something and it doesn't feel right probably isn't but we mm. we accept that over time because we're told it over and over and over again and it's like this you know uh, water drip <laughs> torture on our minds that eventually we just kind of give up and accept it now my question, though, is, is with the people you've met in, in other places, other countries and, and things, how, are, how is their attitude towards each other, the planet, uh, our development of, as a civilization, and where we might be going, not just as part of this, but as an evolutionary process of humanity? Because I'm sure those kinds of conversations come up. My, my, my experience or what I've learned from talking to people around the world is trivial and tiny compared, compared to what we know about people around the world in the age of the internet and social media. Mm -hmm. uh, we have now developed, perfect, not perfected, but we have developed a full out on global civilization. Uh, we, we have been, been working in that direction. Sure. for a long time. And you could say that in 1940s, we had a global civilization. Yeah, but nothing like now. Now we live in a, in a world where you can go online. You can pull up a website from somebody on the other side of the planet uh, in another language. You can review that website by translating it online in your browser to your language. Okay, And then if you like what you see, you can send them an email that they'll get in about 30 seconds 
or you can call them up on WhatsApp, WhatsApp or, or face, uh, Facebook uh, you know, a call or uh, uh, any number of other, just on your cell phone, right. around the world, on the other side. Uh, instant communication, language translation ability, um, and of course, huge amounts of coverage, media coverage, journalistic videos and so forth of what's going on in every country here, there and everywhere else. We're a totally global civilization. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we know a great deal about what people want in this world. And we know that it hasn't changed much for the last 10,000 years or last 100,000 years. People want to, to live. They want to have children. They want to experience this world. Um, and then they want, and then they will pass on. Uh, they want to live a life. They want to, they want to appreciate and have a life. Uh, they do not want to wage war right do not want to slaughter other people they will kill on occasion that no question uh, in acts of passion and what have you but overall they do not want to wage war we understand that now and 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 so okay what's going on well what's going on is that how do i put this or oh, two things okay two things a couple of things one uh to keep in mind that the human personality is a very substantial spectrum. All kinds of different people uh, uh, exist with different worldviews and psychologies, some of which are medically patho pathological, some of which are simply uh, environmentally developed. But so we have a spectrum of personalities and on that spectrum is a group we call psychopaths and sociopaths. And that's, that's who they are. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like somebody that gets born and has an eidetic memory. So they can remember every page that they read. That's pretty cool. And then Absolutely. some people are sociopathic. I mean, it's just on the spectrum. And what we have learned is the nature of that uh, uh, pathology, of those pathologies, is extremely conducive to developing and becoming controlling. Uh, and so that makes them a problem. Just like a cancer cell has the ability to spread and do damage, which is why cancer cells need to be avoided, pathological people like that have the capacity to do some very bad things and they need to be, if not avoided, they need to be neutralized. Mm -hmm. But for most of well, the- Indigenous the cultures, you know, way back when, you know, those outliers, they would, they'd be killed. You know, they would just eliminate them from their society. They, they would either be excommunicated or, or exiled, or they'd be killed. And, of course, <laughs> we, we don't like to do that today. Uh, so we have a bunch of prisons, and, and so we fill them up with, with those kinds of people. And, and, you know, most often, a lot of the prisons are full of people that have, you know, victimless crimes. Let me clarify here. Yeah. I'm sure that the people like that, come to bad ends as you go back in history but there's enough of them that more than enough are able to use that pathology to gain tain power and control in mm -hmm. other words you can't get rid of all of them you can kill 90 percent of the cockroaches in the kitchen but 10 percent is more than enough to make the kitchen uninhabitable yep so that's one point right we we, we and, and and as you go back in time I think the cultures didn't understand this. They didn't, they didn't understand the nature of sociopathy and, and, so, and, and, and uh, psychopathology. Well, I think our nature is more to, to trust, to, you know, like, like I phrase it sometimes, it's just simply wanting to love and be loved and to yeah. believe in others and, and want to have a good life. You know, the, the, one of the things that, that uh, has happened to me recent, recently, I became the executive director of the Global Peace Movement called live and let live so that simple philosophy right we kind of divide it into to two same principle but two different sides one's the legal side that's the live and eliminating aggression which would be those sociopaths and, and their activity and at least some uh, part of that and then the other is let live which is a moral principle and so as long as you're, you know, happy and doing what you're doing and you're not aggressing and you're not harming others in any way, then everything's fine. You have the freedom to just be whoever you are. And, really good. We and have unfortunately, that, that attitude 
um, it marries up very badly with the, the sociopath. Mm -hmm. All right. In other words, the people that want to live and let live are very vulnerable to the sociopath and the psychopaths that, that seek power. Have been. Have been. Now, that's <laughs> the reason why the, the legal principle is in there to where ultimately, and it's funny, the, the movement was actually founded by um, a law firm called Attorneys for Freedom. And so the idea is that by establishing chapters all over the world and, and then beginning to integrate with the, the lawyers and the legal profession and the legislatures and things like that, that we move into this power of the people kind of thing where we can actually enforce the laws that are already there and also tweak the ones that need to be in order to make it more um, conducive to establishing peace and maintaining yeah that now granted <laughs> that's a big piece of work uh, you think yeah uh and it's yet massive. and it's yet massive. it seems that with this pandemic where we you know it's almost like a sociopathic movement right where we were cordoned off we were uh, you know told to be uh, obsessed on self-hygiene sequester ourselves be afraid of everybody, you know, that's an ultimate control move. Now, once that faded, you know, it took a couple of years to do that, it's still not complete. People were, began thinking, oh, wait a minute, I really need to be with others. And, and this sequestering and, and the fear-based narrative that's been shoved on us, regardless of, of whether, you know, there was a, a challenge, a health challenge with the virus, but it wasn't as dramatic as what was what it was made to be. And the effect of separating everybody now has turned into okay, how how can we and especially with the internet and this ability that people have of communicating across the world, people are coming together and saying, wait a minute, how can we do things more effectively together? How can we, you know, and it's not necessarily a drastic change. The systems that we have for great systems, we have more today than we ever had as far as our ability to live and, and live safely, healthily, and, you know, and, and enjoy life far more than any other time in history. And yet, you know, there's this, how do we get it? How do we find the leadership and move it into the area that's more authentic and real, which is the same it seems as what you're doing with the disclosure. It's a similar motivation of, hey, let's just be open and honest with people and, and learn how to work together to bring all this to a greater level of acceptability. And not just that, we also know, and the military knows, that this technology that has been sequestered through the truth embargo as well would have a more prevalent effect on our society and, and maybe even help you know clean up our land air and water in the process too has that been something that's been uh, a discussion point there are a, a range of benefits that could come from ending this truth embargo and i'm not unaware of the aspirations that people have towards a workable global civilization Mm -hmm. And I'm not unaware of, of, well, there's a whole range of activism that's underway. Sure. Uh, this takes time, however, and we don't have that time. That's our biggest problem right now. Well, this is where Robert Smith's um, noting the, uh, what the people from elsewhere, is what he called them, or the guys upstairs, uh, had told him about time being a measurement of the change of entropy. So that would indicate that when things are working, for lack of a better, more harmoniously, that not as much time is needed in order to get stuff done. Hmm. Interesting. You know, kind of. Uh, like I can't really speak to that. Uh, it's an interesting concept, um, but we do have a pretty good idea of the pace of things in the 20th century and sure. now the 21st century, and uh, the situation is grave. Um, well, I've had some personal, back in um, mid 80s, I worked for an aerospace company as a production control coordinator. I was in charge of $7 million a month in shipments, 800 part numbers. And so I dealt with tens of, of people 
every day. And there were ways of getting things done sooner simply by behavior, right? By interacting with the people that needed to be part of whatever process was in place or, or in process, uh, not to be redundant, yet by making uh, that opportunity available. For instance, again, it was more, uh, it was an aerospace company, so it was very militaristic in the way it was run, right? The, the standard behavior was, hey, you can't give, this was in production control, right? We were the guys that was in, were in charge of getting things done. <clears throat> and when people are given authority and control, they're usually so in insecure that they want to become controlling and demanding themselves instead of thinking about who their audience is or who the people that they need to get to do what they need to get done and treating them differently in order to make it happen, such as what worked for me. Hey, can I help you in any way? Can I go, you know, what do you need done that you don't have time to get up and do because you're busy doing something else? And that one thing increased the productivity rate immensely. It's all in how you deal with people. So one of the things that I would say is that we don't know how to deal with people, right? We don't know how to be present in the moment and not have a, an agenda rather other than what I want or need. Uh, Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that uh, these kinds of, what am I trying to say? Um, these kinds of aspirations are noble, and I, I, I hope that they can move forward. But uh, it's not going to amount to much if we have a nuclear war. And that is our number one problem right now. Uh, we have been flirting with this for a long time. We, well, based on what you know, do you think we really would? Do you think the, that the people from elsewhere, the guys, the non-human entities or whatever, because of their demonstration of what they can do already, do you think they'd let that happen? It's an interesting speculation. It's uh -huh. not an unreasonable speculation, but unfortunately, it would be a grave mistake to use that speculation as a reason not to do everything humanly possible to avoid a nuclear war. Absolutely agree. And, and that's the whole point of, of activities and movements and things like that that you're, you know, you and I are talking about a little bit is to avoid that, is to learn how to get along. To well, get we, we're not gonna have time to learn how to get along. We, we could have a nuclear war within the next 30 days. Uh, we've almost had a nuclear war on a half a dozen occasions. And so, we, you know, the granular, uh, getting, you know, the granular level of human interactions is, is interesting and, and uh, certainly it, it, needs to be, it needs to be thought about and dealt with and, and hopefully evolved. But we need to, we're, we're talking about the macroscopic level now, all right? The macroscopic level is, one, we still have about 20,000 nuclear weapons. Two, the technology has advanced substantially so that they're more, how would you say, usable, particularly mm -hmm. EMT weapons, smaller level nukes. Um, and there is increasing indication that Russia is very, uh, very much uh, on board with the idea of using some of these more, uh, more, uh, how would you say, uh, less, they're, they're destructive and they're nuclear, but that not, not in the sense of, uh, we would think about the Hiroshima bombs and so forth. But of course it would escalate to the big stuff right away. Sure. We know that they're on board with that. We still have some complete ideological control states. Uh, North Korea is one. And, and, and that, that is not going to get any better anytime soon. The entire country is brainwashed, the entire country, which you can do because people come into this world with nothing in their head except brain matter. And they have to learn back everything. To the point I made about uh, Howard Bloom's book, The Lucifer Principle. You yeah. know, if you're that media control, that programming, and when you do that repeatedly, you're going to become a subject of whatever that media stream is because you've got what, nothing else. Whatever the it's, media stream is the conduit. It's what the government wants. It's what the psychopaths yeah. that are running the show want. 
And when you can maintain that level of control for a couple of generations, you've got everybody. All right. Mm -hmm. North Korea succeeded in doing that. Soviet Union and Russia, not quite as well. However, uh, to give you an idea, we're getting an ex excellent example that it's still possible to control a major uh, uh, portion of the population of a nation as large as Russia. So they have executed enough propaganda and enough media control uh, over the last number of years that you've got 80% of the population of Russia that has cl completely clueless as to what's going on and been completely told something that's not true and they bought it. And that's happening in other countries. In other words, the, you, know, we, we, you don't have to be at the level of North Korea to have a real problem. The United States has got a propaganda problem now. One of the reasons is propaganda has gone populist. Everybody can be a propagandist now. It used to be you had to work for the government or or have some special role. But to now, a certain it's extent, because there are some that are still censored and deleted. And, you know, we found that at the beginning of the pandemic when doctors and virologists and immunologists and, and people with expert knowledge were coming and research were coming out and saying things that were contrary to what the uh, the CDC and, and such were, were talking about. And they were censored, deleted. Again, uh, the, the point I'm making is not whether censorship occurs. The point I'm making is everybody can be a propagandist, whether you get censored or don't get censored. True. Everybody's got a platform. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got a phone, you got a platform. Yeah, well, you got, you know, you, you, you've got TikTok influencers out there that basically just dance around in their kitchen, got two, three million followers. And some of them decide to go political before you know it. And, and, and that's happening everywhere. In other words, everybody can be Tokyo Rose now. Everybody can be a propagandist. And that is manifest, particularly in the United States. Uh, so that's creating a mess. So the, the, Russia has not, it, got some of that, but they have, they have quite a bit of control. So it's more like a state controlled propaganda there. Uh, and, and, and as a result, uh, the ability of psychopaths and sociopaths to maintain, manage control, and to take actions which are clearly contrary to what the vast majority of people want is thriving still, only now it thrives in the nuclear age. And so how do we, in other words, it, if we have a nuclear war, there won't be a lot of need for self-help books or how to, how to work better in your business and how to be a better you know, business CEO or how to be nicer to your neighbors. It's going to right, be- But does that threat, should that circumvent our efforts to do so? I'm not saying it circumvents it. I'm simply saying that that is simply a reality. I'm not saying people don't sure. stop to, 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 to look at these things, but this Damocles sword is hanging and if it drops, it's over, it's done. And that sword is hanging by a thread. And that's where I'm at. In other words, my activism is about dealing with the macroscopic circumstance that we find ourselves in in the 21st century. And that is on the brink of nuclear war for about the sixth or seventh time. Um, this time may be the, the worst ever, right? And the relationship between that dilemma and the reality of the ET presence, which has been suppressed, undermined, and contained and embargoed. Turns out that there is a connection there possibly between this ET presence and our nuclear dilemma. And, and, and uh, one way that we could possibly uh, uh, benefit from that, I, I think is, is, is disclosure. I think disclosure is essential if we're going to somehow integrate the history of ET activities, what they, what they know, what their intentions are, and clearly, hopefully parse exactly why they were turning weapons off repeatedly like they did, mm -hmm. uh, and possibly, uh, more importantly, uh, the paradigm shift that will take place upon disclosure of the ET presence is, is going to be unprecedented in history. Uh, more people will learn something more extraordinary in the shortest length of time than has ever happened before. It's the kind of event that could not simply change the mind of a few people, it could change the mind of billions about how to conduct government, how to conduct affairs, and what they want to do, how they want to structure society in a world where they know that there's ETs and other civilizations. It's the best shot we have, mm -hmm. because if we don't have a paradigm shift of that magnitude, if we don't have a collective, massive global worldview change of that magnitude, we will have a nuclear war. Uh, we're also going to have other 
problems like global warming will eventually create huge problems, but that's still down the line, right? We have to still deal with that eventually, but that's not on, a, on, on the front burner right now. The front burner is how in the hell do we avoid a nuclear war? And the ET has the ET presence has a connection to that. And, and it's, un, it's not, I'm unable as others are, including Bob Salas and the witnesses and all the efforts that they've made. I am unable, and we are unable to connect these things together uh, within the media, within the Congress, and within the mind of, of American people so they could realize, wait a minute, we need, to, we need to address that connection. Why are they turning off our nuclear weapons? What are their intentions? Is that a message that we need to get rid of these? And by the way, these nuclear weapons cannot protect us from them. And so the only people they're going to be killing people is us killing each other, not them killing us. And we certainly aren't going to kill them. These, these videos are where they took out nuclear warheads were being shot into space. I mean, they didn't do that. What they did was is they disarmed it. One instance where they knocked a dummy warhead off a missile. There mm -hmm. is no account. There are no accounts at this point of them in, uh, knocking a, or directly interfering with a actual uh, nuclear weapon on a missile, but that one event, Bob Jacobs' event, very, very significant, uh, and and and, and a uh, another kind of statement that they're making. In other words, this, you know, as as article after article after article is coming out, as interview after interview is being held on the news organizations, and I'm watching them all the time, the discussion of the use of nukes is now daily. Generals, journalists, commentators. Political scientists are talking about, well, you know, there's this kind of nuke and that kind of nuke. And, you know, Putin might very well use that uh, as a way to uh, 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 get what he needs. And, 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 and NATO. And here's the thing, the though. Here's the thing. Even with sociopaths, they still want to live. Right. Really? They don't want to kill themselves. Well, they do all the time. They push things to the absolute limit. When it doesn't work, they, they go into a bunker and shoot and blow their brains out. It happens all the time. Yeah. All right. In other words, in other words, they all know they're going to die. And there's nothing more dangerous than an aging autocrat, let me tell you. So they're all going to die. Like I'm going out. I'm going to take a bunch of people with me. Uh, there's that. And there's but 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 no, I'll 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 achieve my goal. I'll achieve glory. I will achieve. Uh, a, a, a Reich that will last a thousand years. And then when it doesn't work out, they blow their brains out. Meanwhile, they're leaving tens, 20 scores of millions of dead people behind them. Do not think that Putin is not capable of using a tactical EMF nuke in the Ukraine. He is more than capable of doing it. And I'm not the only one saying this. If you actually go and read, uh, the, you know, focus on those articles. Well, we're all, all of us, not all, many world governments are capable of doing that and the question is, will they? Uh, I, when I use the word capable, I don't mean they have the physical ability to do it. I mean, they have the inclination to do it, the mm -hmm. desire to do it, the willingness to do it. That's not the same thing. So I, I, that, that word capable is probably not accurate enough. Is he willing to do it? Yes. Could he do it? Yes. Uh, have we done the necessary things to avoid? Well, here's the thing that, that I have to ask, though. Um, how do we know? That he, know what? Is, that he is actually willing to do that. Oh, my God. We, uh, we have been studying Vladimir Putin for 22 years. Mm -hmm. He has been the, the subject of enormous amounts of intelligence and investigation and accounts. Our, in, in, now, I'm not saying the public knows all this. I'm saying our intelligence community has a very, very good idea of what Vladimir Putin is capable of or not capable of. Uh, and then his actions that he has taken, the destruction of Chechnya, the wholesale wiping out of men, women, and children, uh, similar in uh, Ossetia, uh, though Chechnya is, is, is about as bad as it gets. Aleppo, right? Now, that's not to say that other nations haven't done bad things. We're just saying that if you look at the pattern of, of Vladimir Putin, the idea that he would go ahead and use tank, uh, tactical nukes in some way, thinking he could get, get away with it under the mutual assured destruction rule, in other words, I've used tactical nukes. All I want is Ukraine. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you respond with nukes, I will then we'll launch a nuclear war and everybody's going to die. So you're not going to respond. I'm going to get this. I'm going to win this. I'm going to get to Ukraine. All right. He, 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 is, he is isolated. He is old. He is not well. He's not getting good advice. And so he is right now the most dangerous man in the solar system. Mm. So 
this is what drives me. This is what I'm thinking about because right. that is in the immediate. There's also other things too. You know, even with that, we're we're not inside his head. Uh, there are some things that he's done, like sending vaccines and staff and medical staff and things to Italy at the beginning of the pandemic. Okay, why would he do that? Well, I'm, Russia, I'm not at sent, Russia sent that. Uh, he didn't block it, but we don't know for a fact that. Okay, well, that but Putin he's gonna, gathered everybody together and say, he my wouldn't God, have gone if he hadn't him. given them permission. Hey, look, I, there's nothing right? that he could. I'm just saying that, that there are some other things that we don't necessarily know. And, and as an armchair quarterback, we can say and, and call a lot of plays that may or may not ever happen. We can project and, and do all kinds of things. There are some things, and, and, and maybe, you know, part of it of this is suspicious nature of um, people we don't know or the unknown or, or people that we've, again, been uh, told or rooted in this, uh, in misinformation that we've received and things like that. You know, my wife is, Saint, is from St. Petersburg. She grew up in Russia. And there's a whole different country there than America knows about. I've been to Russia. I know that. The, the yeah. point is not what the, the it's, not, it's not what, the point is not whether they're good Russians or bad Russians. Most Russians are just fine people. I love them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what Putin is going to do. That's what matters. And mm -hmm. in terms of what, what, what his good points are, I'm afraid there aren't enough good points to possibly even remotely counter weight against, forget Ukraine, what he did in Chechnya. Chechnya was a wholesale genocide. He killed everybody, men, women, children, dogs, and cats. He did it with relish. He encouraged it. He demanded it. And it's what got him in power. It's what made him the president of Russia. That's enough. That's enough for him to be eliminated from this planet, right? Now mm -hmm. he's trying to do it again in the Ukraine. And, and, and again, uh, this is not conjecture. This is happening right before our eyes. He has made statements in the press in front of cameras that nukes are not off the table. Uh, that that he, he, he's, he's going to require this and he's going to do that. Uh, there's no ambiguity here. He is basically- You know, a lot of this stuff is posturing too. Well, posturing, you know, the, the, I, I, I don't, send it, sending, a, sending a missile into another country and blowing up a hospital is more than just posturing, Sam. It's pretty emphatic, all right? He's posturing on a grand scale. Uh, you know, we were posturing when we dropped the bombs on, uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Sure. We were basically saying, here, notice this. You need to surrender. Okay. Right. So here we're posturing. Here's our posture. We're willing to do that. Now you surrender. Mm -hmm. okay? we, we're living in an existential time. And we have not done the things necessary to address the existential crises that we face. We weren't prepared for the pandemic. We're not prepared for uh, the effects of massive technology. they are prepared for the effects of massive population. We're now just about to hit 8 billion. We just kicked all the cans down the road thinking it'll all work out. Well, right. it won't all work out. And so now yeah, we basically have to- we got to turn around and, and face music and say, okay, now we've made some mistakes. Um, you know, we did the best we could with what we had at the time. And I think that was the case in the development of the industrial age. There was there wasn't an intention of, of polluting the air, land, and water, you know, to the point that it has. I, I, that was a, a, an unfortunate side effect. Yeah, but that they didn't. In other words, we we the world moves forward. People do what they do, but partially because of technology, we have we have developed the ability to understand what we're doing. In other words, we understand the implications of of our industries and our technologies. We understand the implications of war. And so we've had the opportunity for some time to deal with it, mm -hmm. right? Not, not go, I, got, I know nothing. I have know nothing. I'm just moving forward. What the hell? Oh, no, 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 no. We have known for some time the implications of what we're doing because- And what we haven't done, in my opinion, is, you know, as a population, we need to take responsibility for apathy towards the management of our leadership. Sure, of course, absolutely. We need to take responsibility. The public needs, particularly in the uh, dem democratic countries, 
where we have a significant level of uh, of involvement and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, elect people. We need to we need to take responsibility for electing and allowing to stay in office sociopaths. You know, the challenge that we have is that with today, you know, a two income family doesn't have time for much of anything, let alone raising healthy kids. And so the fast food and the obesity and, and all these kinds of trickle down effects and, and no time for being involved in their community, let alone politics. There is a whole host of things that need to be reformed and addressed mm -hmm. a huge number and they're there and we know they're there wouldn't it be nice if you could find or, or if there would be a way given the technology that we have and the um uh, what's the word i heard it used it had to do with um with tweets right 140 character lifestyle sorry <laughs> so with these kinds of opportunities and the different social media and the, and the communication efforts, would you, do you think it could be possible that there could be something created, um, a, a simple mechanism that shared widely that could actually affect change in a much shorter time? Let's say this, I'll say this. A lot of the technologies which are now threatening us could be used to good purpose without question. It's like carbon. But <laughs> we, it could kill us and it can save us. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately. And we are carbon based. But we have created some very existential crises. Uh, so we first we need to avoid calamity and create a space where we can then start addressing these issues using the technology in a positive way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but again, I think one of the reasons that the ETs have been turned off our nukes um, is, and, and, and also messages that they have repeatedly given to contactees. So the, the, the tens of thousands of people have reported similar messages, uh, is that you don't have much time left, okay? You don't have much time left. It's very simple okay well, so you, sense of urgency we wouldn't move otherwise well, yeah uh, well again Whether that's but, true or not it's another story well i, I think it's quite true and it uh, may be i'm not saying we it don't is. have much time left but 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 it's it's a it's not just in general it's it's there there are certain things that you've got to deal with and you're running out of time mm -hmm. and we chose not to deal with them we 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 buried those events we, we refused to address them. The, the Department of Defense would not in, even acknowledge that those witnesses existed. They, the, 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 uh, there was almost no media coverage. And even when there was finally around 2000 or 2010, uh, it, was, it was minimal. We just tried to pretend that these things never happened. The nukes were never turned off. There are no witnesses out there saying that. In other words, we put a paper bag over our head and we just ran forward until eventually we we're going to run into a, uh, uh, a brick wall and kill ourselves. Like a so, bunch of unknown comics, right? So at the heart of what is going on right now is the, 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 the process leading to congressional hearings, which means military witnesses. And I believe now it's pretty clear that a significant number of those military witnesses, because believe it or not, there's still some alive. You did that up. already. You did a mock hearing. What, what were the results of that? I'm talking about a real congressional hearing. I understand. I understand. Yeah. I understand. It, but there was, you know, there's steps to. Something. Well, it, it was a way to show the Congress how it would go. But that was that was eight years ago. And uh, obviously it, it didn't have the power to really significantly change the, the status quo. But it helped. But it was a small thing. The the real congressional hearings will be a massive thing. And and, and a key key to those witnesses will be the nuclear witnesses. The nuclear wet, uh, tampering witnesses will almost certainly testify at these congressional hearings, which will lead to disclosure, which right. means that at the same time, the world and hundreds of millions of people will be watching these, these hearings, I can assure you. At the same time, the world finally gets it that, yeah, there's ETs here. And, and, and that allows the president to confirm, yeah, there's ETs here. At the same time, they're gonna be learning about, in a, in a meaning worldwide, they're gonna be learning that these ETs kept turning our nuclear weapons off. Why did they do that? And that opens up the discussion. Okay, yes. why did they do that? Why? And, and that may and a proverbial involved, question. Why? And then, and then disclosure leads to post-disclosure hearings, and and then the question is, 
will we be able to shift our focus away from our usual behavior, mm -hmm. which is, you know, creating chaos all around the world, and bring it over to focus for a decent length of time on what just happened. Mm -hmm. Disclosure, confirmation, uh, nuclear weapons, turn offs, what's going on there? What do we want to know next? What can the government tell us and so forth? And get into a, a learning curve on that uh, and putting aside for a while our desire to go blow the hell out of other people in other countries, all right? right. Uh, right. And spend trillions of dollars on weapons we theoretically should never use, which is the definition. And that money would certainly benefit, you know, food, clothing, housing, medical care for pretty much everybody on the planet. Yeah, just even just, from just the U.S. budget. So this, this, to, you know, as I've said many times, what what's what's going on here? And not everybody gets this, and that's okay. It's all right. That's why you have activists that 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 do things like I do. Sure. What's going on here is that ten thousand years into the age of human civilization, we have reached an absolute critical point in which. Uh, uh, one or one of several unprecedented events could take place. One of them is full-scale global nuclear war, uh, which would be a big deal. The right. other is formal confirmation worldwide of the extraterrestrial presence, followed by uh, a complete engagement of that and all the information, possibly followed by open contact. That's also a really big deal. Uh, and uh, in, in some other areas, uh, such as population growth and, uh, and uh, uh, disease and so forth, we are, we're reaching a, 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 some tipping points here uh, that collectively would represent the third big deal. Meaning if we don't deal with a number of these key issues that we're facing, macroscopic global issues, mm -hmm. the consequences are going to be profoundly bad. And so these three things are happening, but the most important, as far as I'm concerned, is getting disclosure, right? right? Before you we have your life to this. What now? So, yeah. Whatever, yeah. whatever what, what life I have, I have given it to this issue uh, a, a, on my way out the door. But more people are joining up. I mean, there is an extraordinary explosion of, of coverage of this issue, of, of, of social media engagement, podcasts. Uh, new publications being formed of quality. This issue is 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 never been addressed at this level, uh, and and for that reason, it, it's never going to go back. It's never going right. to go backwards. It can't be turned around. Well, we we're, put together how back fast we're going to get to 20, the goal. Uh, January of twenty thirteen. It was we put together Ufology Press and launched it at the twenty thirteen International UFO Congress. Um, that was a collection of hundreds of bloggers yeah. from around the world curated into one website which one hasn't my, been done yet one of my tasks you're going to be seeing more learning more about this soon one of my uh projects is uh it's a big one if it if it if it gets launched in time and it will be i think uh is to among other things educate as many people around the world as possible about all the work that was done prior to 2017, right? The researchers, the activists, the journalists, the videographers, the filmmakers that had been slaving away at this for decades, uh, going all the way back. There was effort back, all the way back in the 1940s, in the early 1950s. That they've been forgotten pretty much. Right or are never even known about by the vast majority of the people on this planet. Well, and so the focus right yeah, now is on the guys like Stranges and Van Tassel and Adamski and, and all of those guys that, granted, like you say, not too many people know about them. And yet, you know, what was it? Was it Morley Safer that did a interview with one of them? Or, or uh, no, it was George Wallace. Or, uh, Mike Wallace. Mike Wallace. Oh, yeah, Mike Wallace. There was also interviews with Keo. But, but yeah. most of the world doesn't know about these people. And, 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 and the only people they really know about are the ones that are involved in this five-year process, which is appropriate. I mean, their focus is totally on there. And, and so, uh, but the work that these people did prior to 2017, that's still around. That needs to be completely reviewed in complete detail. Uh, the ones that are still living should be able to, should testify in front of Congress at some mm -hmm. point. 
And so one of my tasks is to try to help educate the world uh, about these people. Now you right. may say, how are you going to do that? Well, that's kind of what we did with Ufology Press and, and the ancillary blog that goes along with it. There are the, that interview, the Keo's interview and, and uh, Wallace's interview with uh, Van Tassel and, and um, you know, the older videos that are still available are, are up on YouTube and, and places like that. And, you know, there's lots of people involved with this, and, and as you well know. And, you know, it, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of like a people's disclosure movement, right? The current, the current process, which is five years on, four and a half years on, is standing on the shoulders of thousands and thousands of people mm -hmm. who were denied credit, who were denied access to resources, who paid a heavy price. But that's not unusual. Every oh, I... major serious change in human society, activist process. As a wake of people. It's tough. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's tough. It's hard. People make a lot of sacrifices. This, is, this issue is no different, though the sacrifice has mostly been in, in, in non-existential terms, meaning it's not you're dying, you're not getting killed for doing this, but, but you, you still have to pay a heavy price. Uh, the people that are coming at the end are also having a bit of a problem. It's not been too easy for them because this thing wasn't supposed to take five years. They were supposed to get, this was going to be a slam dunk back in 2017. So I admire that they've stuck with it. I admire that they're putting up with the problems. Uh, and I understand why th th what they're doing right now is difficult enough without trying to educate everybody about all the issues going all the way back to 1947 and all the people involved. That's too big an elephant to get through the door. Well, I certainly would like that. We were kind of, we, we've gone way past our normal time. And, and what I, I always do my about you, Steve, is your the ten, tenacity and tenure. You know, you've been there, uh, stalwart and valiant war, warrior um, for a couple of almost three decades now, right? 25 years. Look, I, what I don't have in resources and and uh, charisma, I make up when, with tenacity. I am tenacious. I think I, I'm, I'm, I've, got, uh, I've got some OCD in my life. Uh, and I, I have a feeling I may be on the upper level of the Asperger spectrum. Wouldn't surprise me. I wouldn't have known that as a kid. But I think as I've gotten older, I'm going, you know, I think I am. Yeah, uh, a little self-examination. So, okay, where do I fit on the scale, right? <laughs> but uh, the, the, my tendency to OCD has, has served me well. Uh, uh, because you can translate that into tenacity. Uh, so that, that's my thing. But I, I would much rather have got this done years ago. <laughs> Believe me. I, oh, sure. I, sure. Years. Uh, I would have loved to have seen this happen 20 years ago, but uh, that's, that's a hubris I cannot indulge in. Uh, but we have a shot now. Even in 2022, we have a shot. I, I, I have said this many times. If I'm the Department of Defense, which is now cooperating in unprecedented ways, if I am members of key committees like Rubio, like and and and, and other Congress people like uh, Gillibrand and 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 uh, and Gallego and so forth, and knowing that there's there's a need for hearings, they've they've alluded to that. Others have. Boy, I would somehow try to get those hearings done before this political campaign gets underway because it's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be awful and vicious and toxic and nothing good is going to come from it except we're going to spend a couple of billion dollars to elect people that are no, not much better than the people we had so boy if they could get that done before that gets underway it would completely change the tenor of this coming election it will give all of the candidates something non-political but incredibly important to address and talk about and so the concept of disclosure the con well disclosure itself which i think will happen and the, the concept of the ET presence would literally be part of the campaign. Every candidate, one degree or another, is going to have to speak to it. What do you think about the, the fact that the president announced there's okay. ETs here? Well, you know, this is what I think about that. And yeah. so it would just be very good timing. But the pandemic, unfortunately, is not cooperating. And then Putin is definitely not cooperating. And so I fear that we're going to go through this awful, toxic, vicious election. And somehow this hearings are going to be held. Well, and, uh, then, next year. and then there's, you know, the other side of everything is as it should be and there, and it will all work itself out because we are in process of doing so. That's right. Everything is good in the best of all possible worlds and you need to tend your garden. One of the books I read in high school, Candide by yeah. Voltaire. 
I'm not, I don't really ascribe to that, but it was a funny book. <laughs> well, that's because we're used to truncated time frames in our lifetimes, right? These kinds of things take time. And we yeah. want it to happen tomorrow. And just the nature of how it rolls out is like a project, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got, when I was in the, my degree program, we were working with time frames as far as project completion and, and you know, best, worst, and, and medium uh, ideas as far as figuring out, well, how long is it really going to take in order to get X done? And there was a quadratic formula for it as well. But Turns I think out, rule of thumbs, it's going to take you three times as long to accomplish what you want to as what you think it will. What we might end on this note, and that is that the truth is, is that the human race has shown ability to solve and uh, and make tremendous progress in a number of areas. Absolutely, of areas. we're in the best time to, of history with the technology and the services and, and the healthcare and food and things. When you look for it, we've addressed inequities and injustices and fairness and so forth uh we have we we but it, it has taken time there's no question it the, the, almost anything you point to like that significance has taken a, a decent amount of time you almost certainly in every case more than a lifetime sometimes more than two lifetimes the dilemma that we face now is because we choose chose to go down the nuclear weapons path which we had a chance i mean right after world war ii we could have gotten together with the soviets and said look we don't want to go there yeah, but we, we don't like you. Go. You don't like us, but we don't want to go there. We had a chance. We didn't take it because we went down that path. We no longer have the luxury of solving some of our most difficult problems or making life better over a span of one and two lifetimes. We don't have that kind of time. Well, see, anymore. this is where those two phrases, right? They've been around for millennia. The Namaste and in La Ketch, right? That. If that had have filtered through and been a, not just adhered to, but embraced and lived, um, and maybe that's part of what might happen in this paradigm shift as well. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Absolutely. If we have disclosure, again, it's going to be a massive worldview impact, mm -hmm. and it's going to be in the direction of it's going to be positive. It's not going to be negative. Uh, uh, it's going to, everyone on this planet is going to, to one degree or another, have to rethink what it is to be human, to be a citizen of a nation, uh, and what are the things that we, we should be focusing on and, and not focusing on. And, and again, it's, it's not enough to get a, a, a limited number of people changing their worldview right. because they read a couple of good books. Right. No. Well, if we could uh, just get the, the idea of be a better human. Well, that's what does it really mean to be human? And, and how can I be better tomorrow than I was today? Well, that's, that always been out there. Thing. that's always been out there. It, it's been out there for a while, decades. And it goes, back, it goes back thousands of years. It's just that it's just that the population keeps growing. You got you got you got, you know, you're up to eight billion. So uh, and soon another billion people will show up completely babies with no no no, no world well, what, what's uh, interesting is these these new generations have a far greater innate sense of connectivity in life and nature and the harmony with you know self others and, and the planet than has been present right you know we so there's this 20 percent of the populations it's over 60 right now and there's yeah. another probably equal amount that are millennials. So they're these, you know, the two largest population bases in the world. Well, the millennials have a far greater understanding of how life is connected because that's how they've grown up and the generations after them. Now, what they've, as immature as they are, they haven't really learned how to work with that in order to affect change to a great degree. But that could happen pretty rapidly once they do. This is a developmental world problem, though. I mean, it's certainly not the case in Korea. And in some countries, a lot of countries, just surviving is the number one focus. Oh, and, all and kinds it, of stuff going on in Africa right now that we don't hear about. So it, it's, uh, but in the developed world, people have the luxury of, of going there and, and, and take advantage of this connectivity and the technology, and that's fine. 
but I'm afraid the fate of the human race lies in the collective, it, it lies into what all 8 billion people or the major portion of what 8, 8, 8 billion people are gonna think and want. Uh, and again, that we get back uh, over and over again to the same fundamental dilemma. We have not figured out how to prevent people of a certain part of the human spectrum of personality, uh, primarily the sociopaths and psychopaths, from gaining power. Mm -hmm. We have not solved that problem. Uh, and until we do, that combined with the fact that we have built these extraordinary weapons means that we're always dancing on the edge of the volcano. Sure. And we need to get off of that volcano first. And then I think there's a lot of good things that could come from it. I agree. And I really appreciate the time. And I know our audience is, has been engaged in listening to the, to the discussion. And I'm sure they've got their own thoughts too. And hopefully we've made a difference in how they're thinking about things and expanded their um, worldview. Changing the world one podcast at a time. Absolutely. All right, Zan, thank you for your time as well. Look forward to being with you again uh, after we have some more developments to talk about. Great. That All sounds right. wonderful. Namaste and in la catch. Thanks for sticking with us for this episode of One World in the New World. I'm Zen Benefield, your host, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>